Now, uh, for my main talk, um, so I mean as a bit of a, an outline for a bit of the next couple talks, this is just a very quick 15 minute, maybe 20 minute talk, depending how fast I speak, and I do speak fast, um, about community. And it will be followed by uh, Zargum and others on sort of laying out um, you know, their thoughts on um, sort of token engineering 101 and some other pieces of this. So token engineering community, keyword community. Uh, I'm going to start with one of my very favorite quotes, which didn't come from the blockchain field, but deserves to have. And Charlie Munger, you know, worked with Warren Buffett for decades. He has this quote, show me the incentive and I will show you the outcome. And that was, you know, one of the key guidelines that they used when investing for, um, for Berkshire Hathaway over the decades, and it's gone very well. And it's almost like Charlie Munger has a token economy in his head <laughs> of incentives. Um, you know, from just incentives, a lot of amazing things can emerge, good or bad, but having that understanding can really matter. And what I've come to realize is in the world of, of blockchains, there's a whole bunch of different uh, labels for blockchains, everything from um, trust machines to uh, generalized utility networks and so on. One of the ones that's really powerful is calling them incentive machines. And what this means is you can get people to do stuff by rewarding them with tokens. You can structure behavior, you can structure incentives by, um, via design. And this is a pretty radical, powerful thing. And it was really with blockchains that we had this sort of new tool to do this in a sort of next generation way of thinking about it. So with this as sort of as a backdrop, I'm going to talk a, a bit of my own journey doing token design. Um, you know, blockchain land, I, I learned about Bitcoin and even bought a tiny, tiny amount in 2010, which I probably lost the private keys for. Um, but, you know, in 2013, I started really hacking on, on Bitcoin blockchain. And uh, from that, you know, led to building a scribe um, with my co-founders and BigchainDB and more recently Ocean. And really, it was with, with Ocean that I really started going deep on token design. Um, and I actually have to thank Joel Monegro, who's here in the room too, to really make me think about incentives and tokens for the first time. He sat me down and he said, Trent, shut up. You have to think about incentives a lot more. So he, he really drilled me in for like the next two hours. And so thank you, Joel. <laughs> um, and I've heard that Joel has done this for many people. So, uh, you know, uh, we, we can be thankful. And there's a lot of people in this space that I can be thankful for uh, over time. You know, we are all helping each other. We're all growing this pie together. So my, my personal journey with Ocean uh, Ocean is really um, trying to address the problem of data silos. So, um, you know, we have the issue of data silos, which leads to problems with democracy and personal data and so on. And it's really sort of this incentive for companies to hoard their data. And what Ocean is about is to try to change the incentive from uh, data silos to more democratizing data and making it available to more broad number of people while respecting privacy. So with this sort of goal in mind, myself and my colleagues started iterating on the token design for Ocean about a year ago, last May, last June, July. And this is some, some pictures of various whiteboards that we went through, sort of June, July, August. And you know, some of these are from myself and some from colleagues iterating. I see Demi's in the audience, and he was doing a lot of this. And we were iterating on different ideas, um, you know, trying different algorithms, asking different questions, um, and you know, looking at different pricing strategies for data and so on. And it was really fun and it was really intellectually stimulating, but we found that we were flailing. We didn't know when we were done. So, you know, we had lots of cool ideas. We had them partially documented with photos of whiteboards and in notes and so on. But how did we know when, when we knew we had a design that we could sort of run with, at least as a first stake in the ground, right? So it's actually really hard to do token design, we discovered. The default is to flail, possibly to fail, right? And so I started asking myself, OK, I'm an engineer. Um, where's the structure to this process? What can I do to help structure this process? And, and others have been starting to ask that question too. And uh, I realized a couple things. Um, and, uh, and some of this too, like Simon de Lourvier had noticed this, this first one, for example, tokenized ecosystems are evolutionary systems. So there's um, uh, an evolution happening in the sense of survival of the fittest. You have these sort of individuals running around called miners. And um, then they try to add value to the system. And if the system likes the value that they've added, then the system gives them tokens, right? That's actually very similar to evolutionary systems. And what it means, though, is um, if you have a background in designing evolutionary algorithms, and fortunately I did, then um, you can actually treat design of tokenized ecosystems as um, evolutionary algorithm design. Now, there's a whole bunch of other ways to approach this, too. But this was something that you know, made sense for me, given my background. So this is really cool because if design uh, um, can be like evolutionary algorithm design, well, then I start to have a process. 
So when you're designing an evolutionary algorithm, if you've done it for a while, um, you know, you've kind of graduated from the ad hoc approach, there's really three steps, right? You formulate the problem, which is the objectives and the constraints and the design space. And this is common across the board, not just evolutionary algorithms, but a much broader class of optimization problems. Um, so you formulate the problem, objectives, uh, constraints, design space. Objectives are things you try to maximize or minimize. Constraints are things you have to meet. And design space is you know, what can you run around in. And then you try to use an existing solver for evolutionary algorithms. Um, for example, if you're doing multi-objective, you might use NSPA2. So you try not to reinvent the wheel. You just try to you know, solve it as easily as you can. And if you need, you try a different pro problem formulation. Maybe you know, if it fails, you try something else. So if you're lucky, you can cast it, for example, as a convex optimization problem. And that's really great if you can, because then you actually can solve it in polynomial time, which is much nicer, right? Um, or maybe you try uh, different solvers as well. Um, and then only if needed do you design a new solver. That's step three, a new evolutionary algorithm or otherwise. Now, it's really tempting to do that upfront before anything else because it's fun, right? It's really, really fun to sit down and play and play and play. But you can easily lose months or years of your life by doing that, right? So you'll have a lot of fun, but what will it be your outcome? So if you can actually have the discipline to, first of all, write down what it is you're trying to go for in terms of very specific objectives, constraints, and design space, and then use off-the-shelf patterns, you can save yourself a lot of time and heartache and actually spend your re real energy on you know, what needs uh, inventing or changing and so on. So to give a bit of a feel here, right, in formulating an optimization problem, this is a, you know, a, a snapshot of a paper that I wrote 10 years ago, but it's very standard. It's basically saying minimize uh, f of i, where you have one or more of these, and those are the objectives, the f's, and then you've got the g's and the h's, which are the constraints, and then that last line is basically the design space, right? So this is a general problem, but um, if you write a paper, you, you actually often copy and paste a formula like this, and then you say, my f's are this, my g's are this, and you write out the equations for this, or you show how you will measure or evaluate that, right? Um, and then you try an existing solver for, in my case, I'm just talking about evolutionary algorithms. So this is an existing where I um, run, where I, I, I ran a solver 20 different times, and you can see about half the time, the black curves especially, it, it converged, right? But about half of them, it actually failed. So it wasn't doing so well. And that's not very reliable. What if, you know, what if you're deploying a tokenized ecosystem and you, it's a 50% chance that it will fail, it will never converge, right? That's not so good. So ideally, you have something where it's going to converge reliably every single time. Um, so if you need, you can design a new solver. So this is a snapshot from another paper I wrote, you know, more than 10 years ago as part of my PhD where I had to design a new algorithm, right? And in the end, uh, you design that new algorithm, and um, if it converges, great. If not, you have to keep iterating. So that's um, an example from evolutionary algorithm design, right? But it's kind of cool. You can actually take these same steps and apply them to token design, designing tokenized ecosystems, right? Formulate the problem. What are the objectives? What are the constraints? What's the design space? And then you try an existing building block, right? Um, you can call them a crypto-economic primitive if you want, but that's really sort of just the leaf nodes. It might be higher level stuff. Um, and only if need, and if needed, you try different formulations, right, of the problem, or you try different solvers, right? And then if needed, you design a new building block, right? But only if needed. And once again, it's super tempting to come up with a new thing because you want to have something fancy and new for your ICU or whatever. But you know, you're um, it's you're better off to spend your efforts on where the actual problems lie. So in terms of formulating the problem, um, and as an example from Ocean, uh, on the left, um, a, a really great um, starting point is asking, who are the stakeholders? Who are the possible participants in the network? And we brainstormed and we came up with about 15. And most of them didn't need to be in the network itself. They could be um, one level, two levels up, off chain. Um, but in, for the network itself, in Ocean, we enumerated, you know, there's the providers of the data, um, and then there's the consumers of the data, and then there's people who can refer uh, there's people who validate, uh, and then there's the chain keepers themselves. And for each of them, you can ask, what are their gives? What are their gets? Right? And so that's what we did with Ocean. And then from that, you can start saying, OK, um, how do we, uh, we can turn that into objectives and constraints. And so it's really useful to uh, ask, you know, what am I trying to maximize or minimize in, in this system? Um, and you brainstorm, come, down, come up with 10 or 20 things, you know, over beers or otherwise. We did this with Ocean, and then in the end, we ended up with something the objective of Ocean, the objective function, is maximize the supply of relevant data, right? Um, and with that objective function, um, we could turn, cast that into basically a block rewards function so that it will give out Ocean tokens when people do that. Um, and we had uh, a checklist of things that it had to meet, which are basically constraints. Things like, are there incentives for supplying more data? Is, are there incentives for referring? Are there uh, is there something about spam pre prevention? Uh, what about the same thing for free data? So handling priced data and free data, you know, for data marketplaces as well as the data commons. 
Um, does the token give higher marginal value to users versus hodlers? This is actually a really useful one. Thanks to Fred Ersam for teaching me this. Um, what you don't want is everyone just hodling um, the, the coin and not engaging. Um, ideally, you have a lot more people engaging. Yes, it's higher velocity, so maybe that affects your token price if you, if you follow some of Chris's models, but there's other ones where it's actually not necessarily um, about that. So velocity in general is a good thing, and you know, I, 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 really, I really like Numerai, where um, they found that the top 50 token holders, 67% of them are engaged, which is actually really, really awesome. Compare that to a typical hodler of Bitcoin, you know, you know less than 0.1% of the network is running miners, right? So, so this is actually really useful objectives and constraints, but it turns into a checklist. And what you can do then is you say, okay, try some existing patterns, right? Some patterns for curation. Um, what are the proofs below? The proofs are really important because this is a way of measuring, did something happen, yes or no? You know, what's the work going into the system? Um, curation, this is things like TCRs, um, curation markets, and so on. But there's other patterns, right? For identity, reputation, governance, and so on. So you might say, okay, let's just try a TCR on, on this and see if it works, yes or no. You know, what's the simplest thing that could possibly work? So what we did was we said, okay, we've got these seven questions in this overall objective function. Let's try, um, the design number one was actually just a TCR on the actors, right? Um, you know, a whitelist of the good actors. How well does that solve the problem? Well, for the first checkbox, it failed. It didn't, you know, if you have a TCR of good actors, it doesn't help you at all for incentivizing supplying of data, right? What about spam prevention? Well, it kind of works because if someone starts to supply a lot of spam, they can get kicked out and so on and so forth. So that's sort of design number one. Design number two, another sort of, what's the simplest thing, simplest thing that could possibly work? This was a TCR of the data, right? So does it help for um, supplying more data? Maybe, I mean, there, there's moderate pressure within a TCR that can help there. Um, spam prevention, it's very nice, right? You can have a white list of good data, and so on and so forth. But you, know, you can see in design number two there, um, column number two, that it's you know, passing on a few things and only going so-so in a few more. Design number three, design number four, you know, three was a TCR for both, four started to have a curation market. And, you know, none of them were doing awesome, right? So then it's like, well, this is too bad. None of the existing patterns worked, but guess what, we tried it. And if you look around, by the way, I saw from, um, there was an Ethereum hackathon about six weeks ago, uh, I think the one in Denver, one third of the projects used just a TCR. And I think that's awesome because it's like, you just deploy it, you use it and so on. So, I mean, I think that's really nice. Um, so we did have to try new patterns with Ocean, and with Ocean, actually, the pattern we ended up with at the very core was a TCR for the actors and a proofed curation market or curated proofs market for the data. Um, and with that, um, it was you know basically making minimal changes to some existing building blocks. It was enough to make Ocean pass, and that's really good. So you can see that in column six, it passed. So we're like, great, we know that we're done at least with this first cut design. It doesn't mean that it's going to be the perfect design overall, but it's at least something we can you know. Uh, have a, as a stake in the ground to iterate with. We knew that we were done at least for that stage, right? But of course, you know, we would love to verify and validate this. You know, does this design actually work before we put it live, right? And so one of the things that can really help there is tools. And I come from the, um, the world of, uh, of computer chips, you know, and it's actually CAD for designing computer chips, circuit aided design. And if you think about it, right, um, a modern chip has 10 billion transistors. And a team of 10 engineers can design a chip in a matter of two, three, four months. That's not by hand, right? It, if they were trying to do it by hand, they would be there for a century, right? They actually do it in a matter of months. How is that? With tools, right? And they, they manage to do the design to manage all this complexity, but they can also verify. It's really important because to, to ship, to spin one round of silicon, to manufacture one round of silicon, you're committing $50 million. And this is what you know, the Qualcomm's and Apple's and Sony's do. They, every single design, they're committing $50 million to see if it works or not. You better get that design right. Because if you fail, you have to spin again, and you lose 50 million, 50 million, 50 million. How is this possible? With tools, right? There's CAD tools. And there's three types of CAD tools that are really key. Simulation, which is basically seeing the dynamics of the system. Verification, did the design work? And design, exploring the design space, um, leveraging this. So to give you guys a feel of this, for verification, um, first of all, actually, I'll start with simulation here. So this is seeing the circuit dynamics, right? So you, you basically put a circuit into the this circuit simulator. The main one was developed out of the, in the early 70s out of Berkeley. It's called SPICE. And you can see here on the top left is a circuit design. And, um, and by the way, the dynamics of that circuit design are actually more complex than most tokenized ecosystems. And we actually have you know, particular um, 
uh, symbols. Um, you could call them emojis now, even for for circuits. You know, there's a symbol for a transistor. There's a symbol for um, a, a, a voltage source, a sinusoidal voltage source. There's a symbol for a diode. Different things, right? And then with that, this goes through the simulator with various analyses, and that's what the other diagrams are showing: time analyses and frequency analyses, and so on, and showing the waveforms, right? So this is a way to explore the dynamics of a system, right? Um, how does the, the trajectory of the state change over time? So once you have that, then you can go one level higher and say, OK, um, what if I'm going to change the temperature of this thing or, or the voltage? You know, how does that work then? Is this thing working across all possible um, temperatures and voltages and so on? And a tool um, that I'm showing here, this is actually um, a, a worst case PVT analysis tool. This is something that my, my previous company developed. And it's used basically across the board in the whole semiconductor industry. You know, every single chip that NVIDIA ships, Apple, all these guys, they're actually all using this tool. Um, and what it does is it actually it can verify your chip saying it's going to work across all voltage, power, et cetera, right? So you can actually say no matter what conditions that the, this thing is subjected to within these bounds, my design is going to work. This is verification, right? Beyond that, what about the exploring the design space? Um, you know, so imagine if you have a simulator in the loop um, that's um, telling you uh, how the design is looking. Then uh, you can change the various parameters of the design, right? Um, so if you change, um, if you're changing a tokenized ecosystem, maybe you're giving 20% of the tokens um, to the miners, for example, right? What if it's 30%? What if it's 50%? Right? What does that look like? So you can actually have sort of um, simulator in the loop to have interactive design one level up. So this is examples of tools. Now, of course, um, with token design, it might not be as easy because, well, humans, right? A circuit is a, a closed system. It, you can model the dynamics. But what if you actually can bound the possible be actions that actors can take? And then once you have those bounds, then understand what are the worst case dynamics happening beyond. And um, Zarkham, who follows up for me, he'll be talking about some of these things. So it's actually kind of an amazing way that you can go. So if we think about tokenized ecosystems, what tools do we have? What are the ones for simulation? Almost nada. Um, Peter Grzynski with Incentive AI, he's actually um, starting to um, do things there. And there's some other um, quiet efforts that if you look around. But we're going to start to see this explode in the next six months, right? There's many independent efforts that aren't really very public yet. What about verification, right? We're starting to see formal verification used, but that's more for just the sort of digital logic of the smart contracts. But verification of token dynamics, um, there's nothing out there yet. yet. And design? Well, we really have to walk before we run, so we need good simulators and good verification tools before we can start thinking about design. So really, um, right now, it's kind of amazing. We have these tokenized ecosystems to design. You know, there's billions of dollars at stake potentially for some of each of these. We're designing them, these tokenized ecosystems, without any tools, which means we might be getting it all wrong. We have no idea. How scary is that, right? But the good thing is, we're here to talk about this, to think about what we need to build, to make to improve our practice of token design, token engineering. So let's talk about token engineering. So there's a lot of talk of the various fields that relate, right? Um, um, so when you're doing analysis of, of a game, this is really the field of game theory, right? It's a, it's a science. And there's actually the, the related science. It's almost its twin, which is mechani mechanism design. So this also comes out of the world of economics, a bit of computer science. And so it's analysis versus synthesis. So they're kind of twins, right? But these are actually, interestingly, more in the realm of science. And science is really about knowledge, right? When you're talking engineering, engineering is actually more about building systems that work, right? So it turns out if you take mechanism design and you add some practical constraints to it, you end up as with optimization design, which is pretty cool. And then if you take optimization design, which I talked about earlier, you know, using evolutionary algorithms, and you start to apply sort of principles of engineering theory, practice, and tools, and crucially, engineering responsibility, you end up with token engineering. Um, so engineering, um, I'll talk a bit more about that. Tokens, um, why the word token as opposed to some other label? Well, if you think about electrical engineering, that's actually the flow of electrons through the system. You think about mechanical engineering, that is the mechanisms, mechanical artifacts, right? So tokens are the, the, the things that are flowing through the system, right? So that's why token engineering, sort of standing side by side with token economics, et cetera. So engineering, as in the things that get built, um, versus the science of KPI of knowledge. So it's token engineering for both analysis and synthesis slash design. So engineering, just to kind of double down on this, it's, this is straight from Wikipedia, which is, of course, you know, always right. But it's pretty good, you know, it's had 20 years of vetting of this definition. Engineering is the creative application of science, mathematical methods, and empirical evidence 
to the innovation, design, construction, operation, and maintenance of structures, machines, materials, devices, systems, processes, and organizations. It's about building stuff, right? Um, and let me have a slide on responsibility. So, you know, when I was uh, in my very first year of undergrad engineering back in 1994, um, very first week, um, our professor gave us a video of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge collapsing. And um, they, they showed us, actually, throughout my years, I've probably seen that video 10 times just in my engineering studies alone. Um, why? It was a reminder that as when you're doing engineering, when you're coming up with these systems that people rely on, you need a feeling of responsibility. You need to actually feel it in your gut and in your heart. And so that when um, you, you take personal responsibility for your designs, um, to try to make sure that they don't screw up in ways that can be catastrophic, right? This is the Tacoma and Narrows bridge collapse, um, and the en engineers here actually did not anticipate the effects of resonance, and that's what led to the collapse. If they had of, um, then, well, we wouldn't have had that collapse. So engineering at, at fields, whether it's electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, and so on, it has a combination of theory, practice, tools, and responsibility. All of these are critical to um, make this field emerge. The relationship between science and engineering, I've mentioned this before, but it's good to state. Engineering is about building things that work. Science is about contributing new, new knowledge. They're complementary. They're not at odds, right? Therefore, token engineering is complementary to this emerging science of crypto economics or token economics. Um, they are different. And I, I want to really emphasize to you guys today, too, so I'm seeing now and then you know, the word crypto economics used for design of these systems, that's really engineering, right? And it's really useful to understand. These things are complementary, and um, we, we need to treat them as such um, in order to basically improve the practice on both sides to try to minimize confusion. So my final um, few slides are about towards a token engineering community, right? So what's interesting, I, I first uh, gave a talk at ETHCC in Paris about two months ago um, on some of the practices I had, and um, that's when I first started using the term token engineering. And um, it was kind of a pleasant surprise to me when I gave that talk and sort of wrote about it. Um, it resonated with a lot of people. They came to me um, and said, hey, this is really great. How can I help? How can I get involved? And, um, and what I realized was over time and from these early conversations with, with Zargam and otherwise that, wow, you know, like we can really build a community here um, and in a way that we can teach each other um, learn from each other. There's a whole bunch of disparate fields, not just the handful that I mentioned here. There's a whole bunch of disparate fields that actually have a, a lot of things to contribute. And that's one of the reasons that we're all here today, to help teach each other. And, um, and I see this today as a kickoff for a much lo longer, larger trend. So kind of, kind of what I see, the mission of the token engineering community, is to grow token engineering into a true engineering discipline, side by side with electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, software engineering, and so on to do it collectively as a community in a decentralized, permissionless, open source fashion. Of course, that's what we're here about, right? That all can contribute to and all can use. We have a really great inspiration for this, actually, from the software engineering community. So in the mid-90s, there was something called the C2 Wiki. And um, it was actually many of the founders of, uh, of the modern field of software engineering. They created this. It's wiki.c2.com. And on the left, they actually had something called the Software Design Patterns Index. And they were collectively editing this, adding to it different patterns, you know, abstract factory patterns, uh, blocking patterns, and so on. And from that wiki, from the iterations on that wiki, it led directly to the book by the Gang of Four, Design Patterns, which had a, an enormous influence, huge influence, on the field of software engineering in the late 90s. And from that, it actually spawned many other books that are all related, and this really sort of formed the corpus of the modern practice of software engineering. You know, the refactoring book, um, the UML books, um, extreme programming, all these things. There were, this was basically a, a very nascent field in the mid-90s, and by the late 90s, early 2000s, it had really matured. That's a wonderful inspiration to us here as a recent example of an engineering field that emerged. So um, with that, we've actually just kick-started this, this uh, wiki, a wiki for token engineering, tokenengineering.net. And I encourage each of you to, be, to uh, take part in this, and it's permissionless, right? It's hopefully going to be decentralized at some point when the tools get mature enough for that, but it's already permissionless. So in it, there's a few different things. There's building blocks, there's tools, there's reading resources, there's community resources. And I'll talk a bit about each of those. So for building blocks, we've got links to some of the primitives, various types of proofs, um, 
curation, identity, and so on. And notice some of those links are red, which means that those pages don't exist yet. And even if you click on the proofs page, it's right now one page with some links, but it, it deserves and needs your love to get fleshed out that much more, right? The tools too, right? Right now, what are the tools for simulation and verification? The only real public one is Incentive AI. I look forward to a year from now to seeing 10 tools linked there, 20, right? And tools for design, there's not a lot yet, right? So I, I gave some links here um, and others, you know, what are some related things, right? There's related stuff like circuit simulators like I've shown, but we desperately need actual tools. And of course, this wiki needs to, to, to share them. Right? There are related disciplines, so um, people have been putting down already um, some of the d disciplines and links to it, uh, mechanism design, algorithm of game theory, swarm robotics, and so on, right? And also some key resources just to think about token engineering. And there's sort of been a, a, a nice flurry of, of writings in the last, say, four months, six months on this. So I've given some of those links. Some, several of you are in this room, so thank you very much for that awesome writing. And you know, hopefully we'll have a lot more, right? And community, right? Um, and at the very top, you see upcoming events. That is today, right here, right now, right? This event. There's actually meetup groups that are emerging. There's one in Berlin that they actually already met once. They're going to be meeting monthly. There's um, uh, New York, there's Toronto. Uh, I was just talking with some folks here um, with one in Japan. So um, others, have, well, yes, these guys are doing token engineering Japan in, in Tokyo, yes, wonderful. Um, I was iterating with some people who are going to kick off token engineering London. So um, there's emerging communities. And of course, there's related communities too. There's a really nice crypto economics hub with a meetup out of um, Madrid. There's the curation markets community, which has strong overlap. And I will mention actually tonight at 6.30 in Brooklyn, there's a curation markets meetup. So any of you who are here today, I, I encourage you also to come to this one tonight. Ways to participate in the community. Well, edit the wiki, right? Impart your wisdom or your questions, right? Add blocks, tools, reading. When you tweet, when you do posts, um, token engineering hashtag, right? Attend a meetup or start your own, even better, right? And of course, there's actually a mailing list um, too. So Sarah has been driving that. So all the greatest things that are happening, um, Sarah will curate. And so um, basically, you can subscribe to that and and send any ideas there. I so, have a yeah. Is the token uh, not yet, but if you want to make it, <laughs> let's do that. That would be amazing. I really want all of this to be permissionless and decentralized. So please do. That would be amazing. Really. Yeah. So to conclude, um, you know, this is the goal here is really towards the token engineering community, right? Token engineering, as in the theory, practice, tools, and responsibility in the creation of tokenizing ecosystem. There, I gave one framing, like an evolutionary algorithm, but that's just one framing. So Zargham and others are going to talk about other approaches today to approach it more broadly, as well as people drilling into very specific building blocks and so on. It's a field, an emerging field, that we can all create together. And now is the time to start. I'll end it at that. Thank you very much.